All right, so we're going to pick up from where we left off last week. Um, the good news is there, as you can see by my script, it's a lot shorter than last week's. Um, it's a smaller topic for today. Um, but I want to get the announcements out of the way first so that we don't run out of time at the end and everybody just goes um, So for everybody's information, in October, so this week here is basically when course happened. Okay. So on the 15th, you're going to have the theory test in class. Not much I can do about it. Um, the other wrinkle that week is that's also when you're doing your practical assessment, which means, you know, hopefully you've got your, you're caught up on your labs so that you're somewhat ready for it. I am trimming it down from what it was before because I've adjusted how the course is delivered a little bit. So the good news is the practical assessment's actually shorter than the old one. Yay. Um, the go the reason why I try to do this all before the break is so that you have a break. Like there is, the way this was set up originally is that you'd have your midterm test two weeks after the break, because we're not allowed to give you a major test the week after the break. So it'd be sitting here just mulling over a test is coming in three, four weeks. Um, this way I'm warning you two weeks ahead of time. It's multiple guests, it's on Brightspace. There's no fill in the blanks uh, since that's gone so well with the hybrids. Um, so I will send out a fairly detailed list of what you need to study uh, because thanks to also missing out that first week of lecture, there's not a lot of time for a review. Um, but essentially it's based on the slides and the hybrids. So read through the slides, read the content from the hybrids, and you'll do fine on the theory. The practical assessment is basically taking all the labs and getting you to do something from each one in 50 well, 45 minutes. So, no, sorry, hour 45. I was thinking about the midterm. Okay. So that being said, now out of the way, now we're going to get into today's content so we don't fall behind. All right, so as a reminder, last week we talked about basic SQL, um, you know, good old select certain columns and um, and applying what's using a predicate. So this week, we're going to focus, focus on something called aggregates. Aggregates are functions. Hopefully by now you guys know what a function is, at least in JavaScript and Python, you should know what a function is. Um, the aggregates are functions in SQL. Um, they're used to summarize data. We use them to count, figure out averages, summing, uh, finding minimum, maximums, that kind of thing. And I'm going to demonstrate a few of these um, right off the bat. So let's say I go select, count, I don't know why I opened up my parentheses, count, star, from con country, why can I not type today? Okay, here's our first aggregate. There's 239 countries. It's a handy way to summarize your data. Um, we can count specific things. If 
continent from country. And this will give us the exact same thing. However, remember last week when I talked about distinct? You can also include distinct here. And that will give us seven. Because in our database, there's seven different continents. So I'm using count as the example because that's the easiest one for people to understand at first. Because we all know how to count, right? I hope. You know, something you should have learned by grade, by, you know, kindergarten. Unos, dos, tres, cuatro. Cinq, six, set. I can't do it in any other language. Well, I could do it in English, I guess. Um, we know how to count. So you can count all the rows or you can count the distinct values of a given column. What the, the count distinct does is it looks at all the different values and only counts them once for each time they appear. So it tells you how many unique values there are. It's a useful little query. Um, a few other handy ones would be a select min uh, population, uh, no, not city, country dot from country, pretty sure country has population. And the minimum is zero, apparently. And maximum is a really big number. Uh, I'm going with China as my guess on this one. Um, we also got average. Uh, country population. Which gives you the average. You guys basically, you know, you all know how to do an average, right? You add up all the values divided by number of rows. This saves you from having to do the math. It does it for you. And um, the last useful one is sum. Although you're not going to find use it so useful at this point. But this is, you know, the entire population according to this database by country. So that's an example of each of the aggregates. Um, another useful thing about how you can do it at the same time is you can actually Run multiple aggregates at the same time. So if you need to pull up more than more than one set of numbers, you can. Now, everything I've done so far is something you can do in Excel. Or spread or you know, pick your your spreadsheet of choice, Google Sheets or whatever. Um God for Mac numbers. But you know, these are all things you can do in a spreadsheet fairly well. So what would be the advantage of leveraging a database to do this stuff? Well, for starters, a database can do this on millions and millions of rows almost instantly. Because database servers are designed for that. And honestly, other than the count, maybe the min and the max, the rest of these are kind of useless in this example based on the way it is. Any questions about what basically what an aggregate function is? Yep. Try that again. Joins either commands. Yeah, yeah we'll be we'll be grouping stuff in a second. Um, but yeah, so an aggregate function is basically a way to summarize your data. You can summarize, you can count text values, you can figure out min max because it'll do alphabetical. Uh, it'll do math on numbers for you. Um, 
You know when you look, you get an invoice from a store or you get a receipt from a store and you get a total at the bottom of all the things you bought? They're summing your line totals. So they're doing a sum on that. Um, you, a lot of businesses care about what the average sale was. So they'll run a, on the day, they'll run some stats and say, hey, what was the average sale yesterday? And then they compare it to the day before and the day before and that time one month ago and that time one year ago. And they can use averages to figure out what their trends are. Um, it's just, you know, numbers, essentially. But we can get things to be a lot more useful with something called group buy. So group buy allows you to create bins. So for example, let's just say I want to know the population for countries where the continent is equal to Asia. Um, and Europe. So if I run this one, uh, dot Asian, Asia, try that again. There's the population of Asia. There's the population of Europe. And if we want to do the other five continents, we actually have to write it out all five. Now, I realize you guys don't have most of you probably don't have much of a programming background, but having to code this in an application to then make a report would suck. Because um, what happens if suddenly they decide that they were wrong and there's not seven continents, there's nine? Not going to happen, but you know, suddenly we'd have to go back and change all our code to handle nine continents. Then they change their mind, they realize that, hey, you know, really there's seven, you got to change it all back. So there's ways of making the database server do this work for you. So I am going to grab this one right here. I'm going to add the name country here. And I wonder if this is going to do the stupid MySQL thing. Hang on. Uh, no, continent, continent. It does the stupid... My SQL thing. Okay. Um, in every other database server other than MariaDB and MySQL, this would cause an error, just so you know. What it's doing is it's summing everything up and assigning it to the first value it finds, which is North America. However, what group by does, which is really handy, is this. It's grabbing all the different continents and adding up the values for any country that belongs to that continent. It's creating bins. It's summarizing based on um, on um, man, I drew a blank. So when it starts doing the math, it starts adding up all the totals. And it will go total one. We see Africa, let's put a pile in Africa. Then we see in Asia, oh, we'll add something to Asia. Oh, we see Africa again, we're gonna add it to the total of Africa. Has anybody in here ever run a survey? Yes, no, maybe. I got one nod. Man, you guys really didn't do much in school, did you? Um, so, when you do a survey, okay, let's try to turn around. Have you ever answered a survey? Okay, oof. Now, what do you think they do with all those answers? They group them, but they go question one, and you've got three choices. They'll go question one, okay, question one, answer one, question one, answer two, question one, answer three, and then they'll add up the totals in each of those. Then they'll do the next question, and the next question, and the next question. When I went through school, we actually, as part of our, one of our math courses, we actually had to do surveys, as in create surveys, get people to fill them out so we could figure out how to do trends. And we had to collate the totals by hand. 
because computers weren't a very big topic in school. At that point, uh, our school was advanced. We actually had a computer lab, which, you know, the other high school in my town didn't. So goes to show, you know, that we weren't using computers to do these surveys. But what this allows you to do is it allows you to summarize totals uh, by a value, a display value. Um, now, this is fine and all, but we could also, if we want, we can do multiple group buys. And now we got two totals. So as we look at different parts of the world, we'll realize that, um, for example, in Europe, there's the Baltic countries, the British islands, Eastern Europe, the Nordic countries, Southern Europe, and Western Europe. And we want to add up totals for each of those areas. Therefore, we are going to break it down by country, by continent first, and then by region. Uh, this would allow us, in case we end up with duplicate um, region names, it's not likely in this case, but it would. So what it will do is it does the first grouping by country, I mean by continent, and then it takes those numbers and divides them again by region. It's a bit like how I did an order by, where it order buys one column, and then it subsorts on the second column. So what this does is it'll do all the math broken down by the first entry, followed up, and it'll subdivide it by the second country. So what's nifty now is we could actually add all kinds of things to our math. Uh, we want to find uh, the average population and uh, the maximum population. I have no idea what this is going to do. Okay, now we got tons of numbers. And I really should change the order of these columns. So let's go grab this, put it over here, comma there, get rid of this comma, and run it like such. Okay, so Africa, Central Africa. Um, the sum of country populations is this, the average population is that, and the max population is that. Um, Antarctica, well, well, it's zero. Officially, nobody lives there. Um, so if we look at the Baltic countries, we see that they've got 7.5 million. The average population is 2.5 million. And the biggest country has 3.7-ish million. <clears throat> now what's cool is we could take this export and put it in a, in a spreadsheet and make a graph out of it. These are num the aggregate functions is where the meat and potatoes of um, data science comes to bear. It, has a lot of tools. Uh, and honestly, these are just the basic aggregate functions. Different database servers offer different ones. Um, I've seen some that include stuff like standard deviations, uh, all kinds of stat functions. So if you care about statistics, it'll do all that math for you. So you don't need to you know, sit there and figure out how to do the math. Um, so, this was supposed to be here, like such. Okay, and that's the group by there. And that's the multi-group by. All right. So, I'm actually, I'm gonna pull up the PowerPoint in a minute uh, to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Um, but I did say that this one was gonna be a lot thinner than the last, couple of lectures. The last one we're going to tackle is having. Having is the one that out of all these topics today, because they're all basically the same topic, it's aggregates. Having is the one that people have a hard time with. So remember last week I talked about where. Having is similar to where. 
what having does is it allows you to filter based on the results of an aggregate. So I will grab um, start with my clause right here. Okay. Um, let's format this so that it's going to be easier to read. All right. So this is our command that we ran. Um, here's the same thing we were using earlier. I am going to go with um, I'm going to add my where clause. Uh, where continent like. So I just want stuff that starts with A. So this is the where clause I did last week. So what I'm doing right now is I want the sum of the population grouped by continent for countries where the continent name starts with A, and we're summing it up by continent. So what having is, having happens after. So here I go having. And I could go And I run this. Now we've just have Asia. Or maybe we wanted to exclude Antarctica. And now we got everything back minus Antarctica. So the reason why I say this confuses people is because you, I will have you, I shouldn't say you, but I've had students will throw a where clause in the having, it'll do the exact same thing. Here's why this is bad. Because what it does, it actually runs this right here and does the math on all the columns. I mean, on all the rows in the table. And then you're filtering out where the continent starts with A. So it's you're making it do the entire table, scan all the data, do all the math, and then you say, oh, by the way, I just wanted anything that starts with A, which is, now, have you, has anybody here ever had the experience of ha having someone make you do a lot of work and say, oh, by the way, I just really wanted that? We've, most of us have experienced something like that. Um, you know, your, um, your parent tells you to clean your room and you clean it to the point where, you know, you could eat off the floor, and all they meant is they wanted you to pick up your dirty laundry, but you did all that extra work because they weren't clear on what they wanted, or you know, they didn't give you the whole thing. So when you run it like this, what it does is it limits how many rows are being read, and then it does the math. Because we're doing that, it requires less effort from the database server. And if the database server is working less hard, that means it's going to run faster. And if it runs faster, that means that A, your results will come back to you quicker. And B, the, the query ends faster. It means somebody else's work can happen faster, right? So if you're not, it's like when you're going down the hall and there's people walking four wide and you have to wait for them to get past certain points to get around them. But if there's only two wide, you'd be able to walk right past them right away. It's the same idea here. So the having, on the other hand, operates on everything above it. So if I do this, then the having kicks off. So it's going to do all the math, do the summarization, the filtering, and then it'll go, based on what I just saw, I want you to give me things that match this new rule that I just gave you. And there's the rule, basically, saying anything has a population greater than zero, because Antarctica is zero. And now, in theory, we could do 
order by, because you can order by an aggregate sending order, because the Asian continent has the biggest population. So what you're seeing right now is literally everything I covered last week and this week in one example. There's a where clause, there's an aggregate, there's a sorting, um, there's a there's the, the having clause that's sorting it, that's filtering it out. Now, where is always executed before having? There's very few database servers that let you change the order of this statement. You notice how the word having is after group by? So literally you have select from where group by having order by. It's basically mandatory you write it in that order. So if you're in use having, it has to be after group by. The group by is always after the where. But always comes last. Actually, no, sorry. There's one more after order by and that's limit. And now we've just got it, you know, just the one. Uh, but limit in this case is not a useful statement. So this covers what aggregate functions do, how you use them, uh, how you filter on the results of said aggregate function. Um, and it's basically literally an example of everything from last week and this week in one place. Um, now I'm gonna pull up the PowerPoint slides just to be on the safe side, make sure I didn't forget anything important. Pretty sure I didn't. And I'd really like to know why PowerPoint insists on opening up the last slide I had. Okay, okay, I did that. Those are the common ones, yeah. Min max, yep, did that. Why do we need it? Yes, here's the example if you want to do all the continents. Um, group by does the same thing. Um, group by multiple columns, I did that. Having, I talked about that. Um, okay, so, the reason why we have a having clause, and I knew there was something I was forgetting to talk about, because I've uh, once in a while had a student say, hey, by the way, why can't I just put the sum in the where clause, right? So why can't I write it like this? Notwithstanding the fact that um, data grip's smart enough to tell you that there's something wrong at this point, the reason why you can't do it here is the math has not happened yet. The where clause happens before the aggregate function runs. So it goes from country where it retrieves all the matching rows and then it does the math on it. And then, then it shows you the math. However, since in the where clause, the math has not happened yet, that's why we can't use the aggregate function here. It has to be here. Because this all runs and it does the math. It gives you the numbers. This lets you filter on the results of the math and the numbers. And then, well, it just sorts. Okay. Um, so these are the major items for today. Man, do I have time to actually start on the next lecture? Should I? It would not be a bad thing for you guys because it would give you the headway for the mid for the midterms. Yeah, let's go for it. Um, all right, so the last item, and this one's pretty long. I'm gonna actually go through the slides for the most part for this. Um, and then I'll do the practical example in class next week. So I'll get the theory side of it out of the way today. Next week I'll do a couple of demos and it'll give us a chance to actually do a review. Okay.
because this is also, also only 16 slides. Today was 16 slides also, so it works. All right, so in a database so far, you guys have um, learned about creating a table. You know how to add a primary key, how to set the data types, that kind of thing. And we did talk about, um, the, the issue is when you have multiple tables in a database, they have often relationships between them. Uh, remember we mentioned, you know, at one point, one-to-one, one-to-many kind of relationships where a table has multiple relationships, at least I think I did. Um, so when you have multiple tables in a database, often they have relationships between them. And a good example of that would be um, an order in the order details. So how many of you have placed an online order in the last month? So I'd know, okay, only three people, like really? Um, nobody here buys anything from Amazon? Okay, Amazon delivers to my house like every week. But I'm lazy. Um, well, that's not a good example. Okay, how many of you have gone and bought groceries? Hey, food, right? How many of you have gone to McDonald's and bought more than one thing? Okay, good, all right. We're coming up with examples that people understand. How many of you have gone to Starbucks and bought three coffees because you really needed a lot of coffee? Same deal. So you know how you have a receipt and on this receipt there's multiple items. A receipt is like an order and the items on your receipt are the order items. Each order item belongs to one receipt and a receipt can have one or more order items. It's known as a one-to-many relationship. And in databases, relational database systems, we need to be able to enforce those rules. So the way we do it is we have primary keys and we have something called a foreign key. The thing is, is that for data integrity, um, we need to make sure that foreign keys cannot accept values that don't exist elsewhere in the database, right? I'll use the example here at the college. Each of you have a student number, you get assigned to a course section. Your student number, I'm going making assumptions here on how access is set up on the inside, but I've got a pretty good idea how it is. There's a good chance that when you have a course section with a student list, you'll have the course section number, which would be CST8260, 24F, underscore, whatever section this is, 300, I think it is. And then next to that, you'd have one person's student number. Then you'd have that course code again with somebody else's student number, et cetera, et cetera. The thing is that we should not be able to add a student number in this list if that student does not exist. Because then we'd be assigning ghosts to a class. Same thing, you shouldn't be able to add a course to that table unless it already exists. Otherwise, we're assigning students to non-existence. So that's called referential integrity. And the database server has a way to force this to happen. So um, for entity integration, and uh, entity inter inter integrity, into integration, integrity, um, that basically means we want to have primary keys to make sure that we uh, have no duplicated data or that each row is unique, if nothing else. Um, domain integrity means that the data has specific uh, values that a column may contain. Um, that usually, usually has to do with the data types that you can't put letters in a number field. Imagine if you were doing data entry somewhere and you go, oh, I want to put in my quantity B. There's no such thing as quantity B, it needs to be a number. And user-defined integrity sets up the rules and the constraints that sets how the data is manipulated. So these are a few examples, you know, you got the data, the data types, primary key, that kind of thing. Um, however, the big topic for today is data integrity for referential integrity. Um, it means that foreign keys cannot have invalid values put into it. So when you guys log into Access, what do you use, your student number, right? Ever try to type in a student number that doesn't exist? 
it just doesn't let you in, right? Because access doesn't allow data to exist inside of itself that is not tied to a student number. Just like when I log into Access, I use my employee ID. It's a lot shorter than yours. Um, but the records are tied to that ID. So whenever we create a record, for example, your timetable or your locker rental, how many of you have a locker? Two. One winter is going to suck if you don't have a locker. Uh, it's a good thing almost nobody rents lockers. <laughs> But for example, when a locker gets rented, it's tied to your student number and locker number. Right? You can see that, that connection, right? So should you be able to put an invalid student number against that locker? No. That's referential integrity. That's, there's a rule in the database that says values in this column must exist in the parent table, which would be the student. It, that's how it becomes the child. Yeah, so the primary key for the parent table becomes the values in the child table's foreign key. So the child table still has a primary key of its own, usually, usually if it's designed right. So what happens is you'll have a parent table with its primary key. In this case, student with student ID would be your primary key. And the child table, let's go with course section, would have its own primary key, whatever it happens to be, plus the student ID. And the student ID must exist in the student table, otherwise it's not a valid record. And when they set up the rules, if you try to put in a value into that field that does not exist in the parent table, it throws an error. It literally says, hey, invalid value being input into this foreign key. It doesn't really tell you what the error is other than, hey, you're not allowed to do that because the value does not exist. Uh, by now, you guys have discovered how stupid computer error messages are, right? They're not particularly, uh, until you really learn how to read them, they're not particularly useful. The database ones are a different classification of those altogether. So the foreign key allows for consistent data sets across multiple tables. Another table would be um, your grades, right? Actually, technically, your grade would be in your the course section, you know, course section plus student number plus grade. Uh, as far as I can tell, that's how it is in Access, your final grade, because whatever I type here doesn't go straight into Access. It has to, I have to put it in, right, at the end of the year. Um, so it also makes sure that we don't have orphaned data. Um, so for example, with referential integrity properly set up, you cannot nuke a parent record. You cannot delete a parent record unless you delete the child, the children record first. Why? Because if you killed off the parent, then we have orphan records and nobody likes orphans in a database. I had to qualify that. Um, the problem is when you have orphan records, that means it's data, it's not attributed to anything. Therefore the data becomes meaningless. It's just noise. Uh, it's stuff that somebody has to clean up eventually. So the referential integrity prevents people from A, creating data that's invalid, B, from deleting data unless everything that's supposed to go with it goes with it. All right, so we already discussed this one. She brought up the topic of the primary key feeds into the foreign key. So we can skip this slide. Um, so for example, in the world database, when you look at the city table, you'll notice that there's an ID column and a country code, and there's a primary key and a foreign key. The country code's value, and you actually, in data grip, it shows you, it shows you this nice little 
thingy here, although it's super hard to read on gray on black. Uh, let me go see if I can pull it up here to show you guys. Um, city, foreign keys, it's almost unreadable in this also. Great. It's this one right here. It says country code is fed by country code. So in, it's, in other words, it's saying the country code column here, the values must exist in country, specifically in the code column. So you cannot add a value to this column unless it exists here already. That way we don't have orphaned cities. You cannot create a city unless the country exists. Uh, you cannot erase a country unless you get rid of all its cities. It's really dark. Um, so, which then leads me into the mechanicals of it. Um, so, okay, primary key we did last time. So we skipped that. Um, so relationships, this feels so weird because whenever I teach a level two course, I spend almost an entire lecture on this, whereas I'm trying to cover it in five minutes or less. Uh, you'll get way more detail about this topic next semester, but there are three kinds of common relationships in the database. There's the one to many, which is 95 to 98% of relationships in a database is one to many. A customer places many orders. So I buy stuff from Amazon. My history is like pages and pages long. I, there's one of me, many items. There's one of me, many students, one to many. Okay. One to one. Those are not very common. Uh, sometimes they're used to get past limitations of a database server, or we end up with a weird thing like lockers. Lockers are the best example of one to one because each student's only ever allowed to have one locker. And the system only ever allows every locker to only ever be assigned to one student. Yes, I realized five of you might be sharing the same locker. My daughter came, went through high school. My daughter's been through college twice and finished both times. Just, she decided to do something different. And every single time, you know, they all, they all, one person would buy a locker and they'd all throw their shit in this person's locker. Why? Because one person's paying the, whatever it was, $20 for the semester. Everybody else goes, why would I spend the 20 bucks when I can just throw my boots in there too? Right? So that's a one-to-one -one relationship where you have two tables or two entities that have a one-to-one -one relationship with each other. Many-to-many -many is a concept. There's no way to truly create many-to-many -many inside of a physical database server. It's a concept that you do during design stages. It's known as the Kentucky relationship, at least that's what I call it, where everything is related to everything else. Um, and yeah. Yes. That's past that. Um, for example, technically, you guys, so students and teachers have a many to many relationship, right? You have many profs. And profs have many students. We have to actually create things in the database to handle the many to many. We're going to get to more, that's semester. We're going to worry about one to one or one to many. Funny thing is, is when you're implementing a database, they're all one to many. One to one is also just a concept. When you're rolling it out and you create a foreign key, you can't say this is a one-to-one -one or one-to-many or many-to-many. -many. It's always one-to-many. Because all it knows is this cut table with this column has a rule that says values here must exist there. At the physical level, everything is one-to-many. So since everything is one-to-many, that's basically what we're going to be talking about going forward. Okay, now this is where I'm going to stop today. Next week, I'm picking up at slide 13, where I'm actually going to do the demonstration of how this works. We needed to get the preamble out of the way because the demonstration is like 10 minutes. 
Um, essentially, it's see this chunk of red code? That's what lets you create a foreign key. Um, this is basically the country and the table, but simplified from the world database. Okay, so next week I will pick up um, basically at slide 13. And, and then I'll actually have a chance to do a bit of a review for you guys for the midterms and to prep you for your practical assessments. Um, and we're actually technically almost where we're supposed to be now if we hadn't lost that first class. So it's good. We're almost, we're, we're caught up. All right, folks. Um, I'll see you guys in lab. Um, re reminder, you're working on lab. You should be wrapping up lab three. After today, you should be able to take on lab four, which is all about aggregates. Take a peek at lab five. Here's a chance to reach ahead a little bit and get it out of the way. Uh, technically, the slide shows you everything you need. Like, literally, that slide shows you everything you need in one spot. All right, folks, have a good one.